president. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to hear from our colleagues. <laughs> uh, thank you for you kicking go. us off, President Kate. That's what we needed, like to break the, get yes. the energy going. Yes. I love that. Thank you so much. So um, we want to welcome you all here today to celebrate with us um, uh, Black History Month, the uh, Rio Salado uh, contribution to the Black History Month events that are happening around Maricopa um, and, and beyond. Um, we all know that Black History is not something we celebrate just one day at, or one month out of the year. We do it every day in the way that we carry ourselves. It's a part of who we are um, and how we love and support each other as community and as part of the extended community. So welcome to all of you who took the time out of your day to come and acknowledge, support, listen, and engage in this really rich conversation with this dynamic group of women um, um, discussing, as, as said here, uh, resilience and brilliance the power of black women in higher education. But to get us going, um, not but, and to get us going, again, she started us off with a cheer, uh, got, broke up the, uh, the energy in the room. Um, as always, our esteemed uh, president and leader, uh, I always wanna say Dr. President. <laughs> president, I do. <laughs> president Kate. Um, welcome. Thank you for taking time, as you always do, uh, to engage and support our, all the efforts um, that we as a community try to uh, produce in order to, rem uh, to create diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity and inclusion. I think I said that already. Um, at Rio. Uh, so I'd like to uh, give you some time to speak, if you would, to get us going. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dortricia, not only for that lovely and very kind and generous introduction, but thank you also for serving as the MC for today. Um, thank you for your service on the DEIB Council. And honestly, Dortricia, just for all that you do to help our students succeed and to make Rio a better place. So thank you to you because Colleagues, all of you who are joining us virtually, welcome. And Dortricia has put together some fantastic questions for our panelists. So, I, okay, I got to make my remarks, but really we just want to get to what the really great conversation is going to be today. So let me make my remarks. <laughs> um, each February, I think many of you are aware, we proudly join the Maricopa Community Colleges and our entire country to honor the extraordinary com contributions by Black Americans throughout our nation's history. As many of you are aware, the origins of Black History Month began in the early 1900s when historian Carter G. Woodson and Minister Jesse E. Moreland founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. This research promoted the achievements of Black Americans and other peoples of African descent. Today, this organization is now known as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And there, or, this organization sponsored a National Negro History Week back in 1926. Then in the 1960s, I'm kind of proud to say that college campuses across the country turned this week into a month. <laughs> um, as the civil rights movement um, gained momentum. And then in 1976, President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month, and it has obviously been recognized ever since then. Um, more importantly, I think is what Dortricia said at the beginning, is it's not a month we celebrate. We celebrate the, the Black American history <laughs> all year long and all time and all contributions. So this year's event, as was already shared, uh, the organizers chose the theme Resilience and Brilliance, the Power of Black Women in Higher Education to celebrate the impact and achievements of Black women in academia. And having had a few moments with our panelists, we are all in for really just a fantastic hour together. I invite you all to practice our mindfulness, to be able to set aside everything else and just be fully present with our guests during this time. 
they are truly extraordinary. I'd also like to give um, a shout out and a thank you to our new uh, Interim DEIB Council Program Manager, Reina Ferrafino, for organizing today's event, along with our student leaders and our DEIB Council members. Thank you so much, Reina. Thank you to our student leaders and our council. Just fantastic. Um, as a college, we hold true to these values that we celebrate diversity, we embrace inclusion, we honor those who have come before us, and we will never stop striving for equity in educational opportunities and educational outcomes. So I just invite you all to, to embrace this next hour of learning and listening and hearing stories that communicate and teach us so much from our esteemed guests and colleagues who are with us. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Dortricia, and just say, panelists, thank you so much. Colleagues, please join me in just a round of applause, even though they can't hear you. <laughs> We're gonna applaud them now and then at the end again. <laughs> So thank you so much, all. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, President Kate, uh, for those deeply reflective and thoughtful and always considerate uh, words um, as we move into this conversation. But before we do that, I would like to take a moment uh, to hand over the mic, if we will, to our current interim program manager of our DEIB works, Good Works. Uh, and I, I'm i gonna let you just introduce your name, yourself, yes. Ms. Reina, so if you would, Yes, please. thank you. Thank you so much, Ritisha. Thank you so much, Dr. Kate. Hi, everyone, happy Monday. My name is Reina Ferrufino, pronoun she, her, and Aya. I am beyond excited. This is my third week here. <laughs> really uh, happy to be with you all and feeling part already of Real Salado's family. I knew starting off that it was really important to create these spaces and we're, we're able to learn from one another and really counter narrative of the dominant narrative that we constantly hear. So I knew it was really important and, and I wanna thank all the panelists for being so open and willing to share their stories, their journey, some of the struggles as well as getting us thinking, what are some actions we could take forward to really start engaging uh, with our black community? How can we help bridge those equity gaps for our students in the classroom and beyond? So again, thank you so much. Happy Monday, everyone, and let's get this started. All right, Lorena, thank you so much. Well, with that being said, we want to jump right in. But before we get into these rich conversations, we want to start by giving our panelists a moment to really briefly introduce themselves, um, also how they pronounce their names, because we know it's important that we honor people by pronouncing their names correctly, um, and um, a bit about themselves. So again, you can follow along in the beautiful uh, PDF uh, program flyer that Lorena uh, put together for us, but um, we'll start with Dr. Marla. Hold on, I may get, yep, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on, guys. I was trying to be vain. So, <laughs> Dr. Marla Goins, if you would please start us off and welcome. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Marla Goins and pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm an assistant professor of teaching and learning at UNLV and teaching and learning and my specific area of study is um, cultural studies, international education and multicultural education. We also call it CME. I got my PhD from Ohio State University in teaching and learning. I also have an interdisciplinary background in black studies and English and Spanish. I'm an HBCU graduate from Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte, North Carolina as well. And I research black teachers and ways of knowing and cultural and activist practices in Brazil and in the United States. Thank you. Next. Dr. Williams, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Nikia McWilliams. I just want to thank you for participating in this discussion today. I am an educator and coordinator at California State University, Northridge. My focus is in student organization leadership, 
I am of a dark brown complexion and I wear my natural hair in a shoulder length curly fro. I have a dark lip today, dark pink lip, uh, a cream colored blazer and a multicolored African print layered neck band. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, Tara, if you would please. Absolutely. Good afternoon. My name is Tara Heyman. I am wearing my natural hair as well. I just recently started locking my hair, have short twists at about my ear level. I have on a white sweatshirt with Be the Sunshine on it, and I am brown complexion, caramel complexion, and I'm happy to be here. I'm a student at Rio Salado, and I am also um, taking courses at Maricopa College for certifications in IT. Thank you, Tara. Um, and next, uh, Dr. Latrice. Hi, my name is Dr. Latrice Gettings. I'm a part-time instructor at Rio Salado. I wear my natural hair, um, shoulder length hair, um, a blue dress with um, pearls on the side of each side of the dress. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, let's see, last but not least, we have Rebecca with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Reina, for putting this together. Um, my names are Rebecca Namachanja, pronouns she, her. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I am a final semester, final year student here at Rio Salado College. I will be moving on to Arizona State University. I have had an amazing experience and this is just one of many um, that I have had here at Rio and I'm very grateful to be here and again, thank you all for being here as well. All right, well, ladies, thank you all so much. Uh, I think it's time for us to jump right into this. I'm excited, um, so bear with me as I gather myself to make sure that I honor these questions by uh, put a, pulling it together properly. So um, I don't think that you can, I think that the best way to, to to understand people is to understand their stories. Um, and so hopefully these questions will allow us to engage in a rich, not uh, a conversation to that end about the impact of education. When you know that statistically African-American women, women of color have disproportionately to our credit, um, uh, made leaps and bounds in garnering and pursuing and getting degrees at different levels, um, uh, it is, um, it's fitting that we're here today. So um, I'm going to start with the first question and uh, we'll just have a good time with this. So bear with me, I'm having the, my computer's doing a little something here. But so question number one, briefly, if you would, Tell us about your journey to get to where you are um, in your educational pursuits um, and perhaps uh, offer us three influences that have um, uh, impacted your success. Tara, would you mind? I'll start us off um, with this great question. Thank you. I've started and stopped schooling so many times since graduating from high school and that journey wasn't always negative. I just had opportunities where I was blessed um, to be in job positions that schooling just was secondary. It just was not primary. And when I did that initial stop at 19, just working just pushed me. And then I looked up about, I probably was 40 because my aunt was 60 and she graduated from college and she was just so proud. And I just remember her thrill and her excitement for walking across the stage and graduating just sparked my why not so it was never a dislike for schooling just life happened i got married i had kids and just moved on and my job never required the education to go along with it so here i am at 40 deciding that education is the path and 
that is not always an easy decision to make. I looked up having to take sciences that I wish I had taken at 18 and geology and, and history and just courses that at that age, my brain wasn't thinking about it. And I just had to find that push. And I remember looking at this time, my daughters were younger and I looked at them and I said, I'm doing this for you. Mommy's staying up half the night doing homework to show you that if you want it, you have to fight for it. So all of that, and I had barriers. I had a push against me, don't do it. But I stood firm on, I'm going to do it for myself first, but also to show my daughters, everything in life doesn't come easy. And sometimes you have to overcome every obstacle and every opportunity and make it a positive. And so I am finished my associates and I've been finished my associates for about two years now and just working on certs because I haven't given myself that path of what my next step will be. But in all of that, my daughters were influenced. My aunt was an influence. My, I, I remember passing the course and my dad has since passed last year, but I remember it was the smallest thing and he called me all day long. And he was like, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. And that just alone, just, I gotta do it. I gotta do it. And I, I am thankful that he lived to see me accomplish some of the toughest parts of this. Mm -hmm. But through all of this, there wasn't just one influencer, it was life. And I know we probably can sum life up in so many different facets, but that was my drive to get me where I am now, which is finishing my associates, working on some job related certs, but also just determining my next steps. So thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, wow, beautiful, I love that. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to, to share, um, maybe? I can. All right, thank you, please. You no, know, my journey to get to where I am uh, begins with foster care. Um, my first influence was my lack of consistent education throughout high school, um, just because of the moving, constant moving. Um, the second was the housing desperation that I was experiencing, because back then foster youth were emancipated from all care once they graduated from high school or reached the age of 18. And I found out that college offered housing. So um, that was the original reason why I applied. I'm grateful that I had a black woman as a high school counselor who realized, um, you know, I realized this as an adult that my counselor made sure I took all of my A through G's. Although I did not have any parental figures showing up for my four year planning meetings or had any idea about college requirements or college planning. So that was incredibly important and then my third influence was my younger siblings so what kept me there was besides my interaction with the community the, uh, that i involved myself with on campus but also my younger siblings i felt the need to change our future trajectory by being an example and by creating a family legacy path um, for them and then also any offspring that would come Thank you so much, Dr. McWilliams, for sharing that. Um, did anyone else have anything that they'd like to share in addition to that for the first question, or should we move on? Irene. I, I would like to share. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so um, as I said, I'm, I'm from Ohio. So I grew up in Columbus, Ohio with my mom and three brothers, the two older brothers and younger brother. And growing up, I always really loved school learning. Um, and also attended underfunded schools. So I knew a lot of people around me who were very smart, but at the same time, they weren't getting the same out of school. And so my brothers did not actually graduate from high school, but my older brother, my oldest brother, I should say, um, did get his GED several years ago when I was in my PhD program. Um, and so that is something that influenced me because I started to realize when I got into about high school that there are some schools that received a lot of funding compared to the ones I went to, and there was also a difference along race lines. So I think that my personal experience of um, 
coming from underfunded and then also predominantly black schools and knowing that there was a funding disparity was something that influenced me. I remember that um, in Ohio State Law School, they came to my high school and they presented us this essay contest if we could read this book by uh, Jonathan Kozal called the, called the Shame of a Nation, The Restoration of Apartheid Schooling in America. And uh, that book was about um, having been at the time 40 years um, post the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech, schools were still segregated. And I wrote about my experiences having gone to a recent program at the Ohio State University, which was for the gifted. And I wrote there, um, I wrote my application based on a black feminist poet, Maya Angelou. But when I got to the program, most of the kids were from white suburban neighborhoods and sort of exurban neighborhoods throughout Ohio. And I really felt I didn't belong, mm -hmm. but even though I, I had that adversity that also helped me to really think critically about my experiences. And so that was something that influenced me. And then when I was in my PhD program, one of my brothers passed away, one of my older brothers. And um, that was something that actually made me wonder if I wanted to keep going at first. But then I think that um, keeping on going through that, I realized that through my research, I could do something to try to engage um, educational inequities for black folks um, and sort of um, help to repay the education debts that are owed to us. Also early in my program, my mom got her nursing degree. And so that's something that helped me to keep going because I realized if she could keep going at that time, right after my brother passed that I could too. Mm -hmm. So my influences have been my brothers, also teachers who cared. Um, I remember I had an elementary teacher named Mr. Smith and he saw my grandma had teach me how to type on the typewriter. So he gave me some colorful paper and influenced me to keep typing. <laughs> and then also I had a black woman who helped me on the job market. Her name is Kay Melkor Quick Hall. So those are my influences. Thank you so much, Dr. Goyans um, and panelists for sharing. Uh, moving on to our second question, because I really want to make sure we, we you, you're given the time you, you need and deserve. Um, for this conversation. Um, I kind of took this question from um, a movie that some of us may know um, called Love and Hip Hop. And there's a question that they pose, right? So if you know, you know. If you haven't wa watched it, it's a, it's a throwback. But there was a question that's relevant to this. When was the first time you fell in love with hip hop? But from an academic lens, I said, hmm, when was the first time? that you fell in love with learning and to that end who influenced your passion for knowledge so becca would you mind uh starting us off on this this particular question absolutely and i have to laugh because when you said love and hip-hop i thought about the reality show not the movie oh. <laughs> okay um, so that was that was a bit of a i guess a generational moment there i um, think so <laughs> thank you um, but it's a great question, and when I saw the question, immediate light bulb moment for me, because I'm an immigrant. Um, my childhood was spent in um, Kenya, is where my father is from, and the town that I was born in had one library that only professors were allowed to go into. So any type of books that you were exposed to were basically what your school had. Or um, if you had the luck, which I was lucky, my father, um, he kind of collected books. He wasn't a hoarder, but that was the one thing he did hoard over the years was books. Um, but it was a strange patchwork of like 18th century British literature or like 16th century Russian literature, that kind of thing. So as punishment, um, my mom, instead of making you sit in a corner or get the switch, it was sit in a corner with a book grab a book off the shelf and sit down with it. And um, as my luck would have it, the moment I opened the book, it was like this conspiracy between the author and my mom to like, you know, capture me in that moment. And I strangely just out of a natural curiosity and to this day, my favorite books are 18th century British literature. Um, I remember reading A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens when I was like, six years old. 
And unlike my brothers, I actually enjoyed the punishments. I was good to go to sit there and, you know, re read 300 pages worth of words, half of which I couldn't understand, but it was just fun um, to see all these characters brought to life. And so I think that for me was the beginning of um, sort of a lifelong love for learning. Um, and so I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be able to actually pursue that at the level or at a higher level at this time. So. Thank you so much, uh, Becca. Uh, as the daughter of a professor and a librarian, um, my punishments sounded very familiar. Um, it was always a three or 400 page book. I was six years old and my father handed me, I think five actually, W.B. Du Bois' autobiography. And that was the first book that I ever read. Um, and it was a challenge, obviously, at five, but uh, that was the first book. So he set the bar high. So I, pre I, can, I understand that. Um, ladies, anyone else want to join and share the, uh, when was the first moment that you fell in love with uh, education and learning? I can um, share. My story is um, a little different. Um, listening to that question and uh, falling in love with learning, I feel like I fell in love with learning at an early age, but my learning came from stories um, being told from my, whether it was my paternal grandparents or my maternal grandparents, just sitting around them, sitting around my aunts and uncles and listening to them share stories. That's um, what I really enjoyed, listening to um, stories that they told. So that was my love from of learning from my elders. And then um, just being observant, listening to them um, until they told me to get out the room and go play. But other than that, um, listening to those stories, gaining wisdom from them. Um, there's a lot that you can learn from others. It doesn't always have to be sitting down reading a book, but just listening to the stories, the lived experiences that others um, tell, you can learn a lot from those stories. And then um, for someone who influenced me when it came to my passion for knowledge, I would say that it's my paternal um, great aunt, my aunt babe. Um, she's deceased right now, but um, my aunt babe, Virginia Scott Brown, um, she was very eloquent, um, very strong, independent, and intelligent. Um, lady, and I always um, looked up to her. I always inspired to be similar to her. She was also an educator. Um, she taught um, until she couldn't teach anymore. And so that was one person who really influenced me to go into the field of education and servicing others, and also not only servicing them by providing the academics and the curriculum, but sharing lived experiences and having those moments with my students where they can share their stories. Because I believe within the field of education, it's not only about education as far as that curriculum, but it's us as educators, as instructors, providing those real life um, skills that they will need once they get into the real world, whether it's their pro professional life or their personal life. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Latrice, thank you so much for uh, um, providing us with another aspect of this really rich experience, which is the, the historical context of the griot, of the oral conversation, the oral legacy, whether it's, you know, and that has that that is a legacy that comes from our original, you know, as far back as our African roots, you know. So this is um, something that oftentimes is forgotten in academia. And I appreciate you reminding us of how that the oral stories and traditions impacted your love of learning and your pursuits. But with that being said, Dr. Latrice, actually, I'm going to ask you the next question, if that's okay, since you're on a roll. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this question <clears throat> shifts the lens a little bit. Um, and I wanted to ask, what were and or are 
some of the barriers that you have had to face in order to pursue your academic goals? Again, what were some of the barriers that you had to and may still have to face pursuing your academic goals? If you'll start us off, Dr. Latrice. Yes, um, there are so many barriers. Um, I would say one barrier that I had um, growing up on the south side of Chicago, attending a school that was 100% Blacks, um, is that limited access. Um, that was a barrier from elementary, middle school, high school, and trying to navigate into college. I was raised by uh, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, my grandmother being Native American, my grandfather is Creole, so neither one of them finish elementary school, neither one of their parents could speak English, but they always instilled um, education, go to school, you need to go to school, you need to complete school so you can get an education. But one of those barriers I would say was that limited access um, that I had because of the school that I was in, um, that quality education. Um, a lot of the classes that I was in, they didn't have enough books for all of the students in the classroom. We had to share books. Another barrier was um, the lack of mentorship. Um, my throughout my journey going into college, having those mentors to be able to talk to um, those who've already been through what I was trying to um, go through with finishing my classes, having someone to talk to, those moments where I might have been feeling, having that imposter syndrome of I'm not smart enough or I don't fit in in this college environment and not having someone to talk to. Um, another barrier, I would say myself, um, that self-confidence. Um, sometimes as individuals, we don't hold ourselves accountable. We're not always honest with ourselves, but that was a barrier for me is that lack of self-confidence, not having that self-efficacy and believing in myself, believing in my abilities and my skills and believing that I did deserve to be in college. I did deserve to not only complete my bachelor's degree, but also continuing my education, receiving my first master's in early childhood education, my second master's in administration, and furthering my education to complete my doctorate in organizational leadership. And then along the way, also receiving a certificate in gifted education and receiving a certificate in English as a second language. But it took me um, building up that confidence, having that um, self-efficacy, believing in myself. So getting over that barrier of myself. Um, the third one I would say is the cost. That's a, a barrier a lot of times for um, black students or minority students um, is the tuition cost. Um, the lack of having black um, instructors. Um, I don't think I had a black instructor until maybe high school, probably, as my first um, black um, instructor. There wasn't many at the university that I attended. Um, and especially once I continued my education into my master's program and especially my doctorate um, program. So that lack of black leadership, whether it's instructors or administrations at these in these departments within the universities, um, it's always um, comforting um, when you're able to see leadership that you can identify with, who you feel com may feel more comfortable talking to. And then also, um, I think um, another barrier is family responsibility. Um, I said I was raised by my grandparents. Um, my grandfather died when I was in fifth grade, so that left my grandmother to take care of my three other siblings and myself. 
And so that once I finished high school and entered college, I didn't go away um, to school to attend college because I felt like um, I should stay home to help my grandmother take care of my younger siblings. And also um, my father, I have two other siblings that my father was raising. So I felt compelled to also help my father with raising my two younger um, siblings. So having that responsibility um, of raising not only my siblings um, with my grandmother, but also my father. So those I consider um, my barriers in my path um, with my educational journey. Okay, Dr. Gettings, thank you again. Amazing. Um, I'm going to move forward, um, but please feel free, panelists, if you're inspired, if, if the spirit moves you, be moved, okay? Because um, this conversation is bigger than these questions in some ways, and I don't want us to be limited or constrained by that. But I do want to... Uh, shift lens a little bit and uh, ask Dr. Nakia McWilliams um, if she would share with us um, how has your lived experience as a Black woman informed your relationship with academia? Absolutely. And, you know, it, my response will go in line with, with Dr. Gettings in that I, too, had a similar barrier. So I'll, I'll combine both of my answers to this. Um, the most significant barrier for me continued to be an ex-foster youth, and that really has not changed. Besides the financial burden requiring me to take on lots of student loan debt and needing to work full time, I was even further away from my younger siblings and watching them get lost in the system. Uh, throughout my time in college really made a major impact on me and caused me to have a lot of frustration, so much so that I spent my 21st birthday in court fighting for custody and being awarded custody of my little sister. Um, the lack of preparation for living independently, college life, and, you know, like the... Like Dr. Getting said, the family care responsibilities were incredibly unexpected. The lack of services for foster ex foster youth back then was inhumane and has led to current changes. But being an ex foster youth and truly not feeling like I belonged, combined with the intersection of being a black being black and a woman at a primarily white institution, was the and remains the most significant barrier to my pursuit in uh, California, but particularly um, in higher education. And so answering your question about my lived experience as a black woman um, and that relationship to academia in, in the age of the belonging theory, uh, I know that most people will not agree with what I'm what I'm going to say. However, because of my lived experience, I choose not to fight the sense that I do not belong because that is my reality in, in academia. Um, and that is true among most populations, black, brown, white, etc. I am always made to feel like I should not be there. Uh, my ideas are not in line with tradition. I say the things I shouldn't say. I work with students differently and I do not fit. But unlike most, I take pride in not fitting or belonging. I do not want to belong amongst the dysfunction, the injustice, the disguised hatred that takes place uh, with a smile while claiming DEI ideals within academia. I hope though, to find or make a space within academia where I truly belong, where authentically like-minded people believe in what I am doing and what I will do to make change. And so that is why I say. Oh, uh, drop the mic. Can we just, yeah, round of applause. Like, let's just, thank you so much um dr mcwilliams for saying that for saying what a lot of us feel and experience in very real and tangible ways every day in this pursuit of academia um wow 
Does anyone else, would anyone else like to chime in or add their thoughts along the same line? Ladies? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Marla. Sorry, was someone else going to speak? No, you go ahead, Dr. Marla. All right, okay. okay. And I was thinking earlier as you were talking to her that you look very young, but <laughs> so let's say that. Um, so, so how has your experience as a black woman informed your relationship with academia? And I thought about a couple of things. Um, one of them, I've been thinking a lot about um, double consciousness lately. And speaking of W.E.B. Du Bois, um, you know, he, he describes this double consciousness as a sense of, you know, having a lens of being African American, but then also always having to contemplate how others, how the dominant world sees you and specifically seeing yourself through a lens of whiteness. Right? And so with that, I thought about how sometimes you could feel a sense of fatigue by always having to negotiate how other people see you. And so I've just been thinking about how can I bring, be myself in a space, even when, as Dr. Nakia said, I'm in a space where I don't necessarily belong. I don't traditionally belong there, but still being myself and um, thinking about the notion of code switching. And I don't think code switching is bad. And I also don't, I know that there's not just one way to be, think, and speak Black, but thinking about um, how can I, when I'm most comfortable, when I most feel like I belong, like when I'm with my family, how can I also bring that into other spaces, into my workspaces? And how can that help me to support um, students more too, and my Black colleagues? And everybody around me, because if I'm able to fully be myself, I can more fully contribute to the world and to my workplace. But so I've tried to stop code switching as much. I know that's probably not an abs absolute, but I feel like when I do that, I'm more buoyant and I'm more energetic and I have more energy for the work I do <laughs> and I get more ideas, um, such as tomorrow we're having a black read in but I have more of the confidence to have those ideas when I'm, I can more be myself. Um, I don't have to worry about saying the word eight and I just, you know, it's just, it's just okay. Um, and so um, also, and isn't just about uh, being a black woman, but just the importance of protecting my joy. Um, you know, and, and I know that historically joy and, I'm, and my one of my mentors told me this before coming into academia, but that sometimes academia has portrayed joy as sort of an ineptitude. So if you're too joyful, then that must mean that you're not rigorous, but that couldn't be, you know, further from the truth. So that humility, joy and love, I consider those my strong suits. Um, so. So the importance of treating everyone well, and, and that in itself is, I believe, a transformative stance um, and something that can help to foster equity, treating everyone well, no matter who that is, from in and out of academia, um, taking the, I work at a, a public institution, taking the opportunity if there's someone experiencing um, homelessness to welcome them, you could come visit my class if you want uh, to check on them. Treating everyone everyone well because I believe the first shall be shall be last mm -hmm. is also something that I um, I believe informs um, comes from my lived experience and my faith as well um, and trying to also keep that connection with with my family to make sure that they like hey, I'm having this read and if you have a poem you want me to read I'll read it tomorrow um, that helps me to bring my full self here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, ladies, uh, for sharing those uh, beautiful insights. Uh, there's something just a real quick housekeeping thing. There's some language that we're using here insularly, like uh, we talk about attending uh, code switching. Go Google it. It's important that people who don't understand what code switching is, that you you do that. Um, it's 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 there's a lot to that it's a unique gift but it's also very labor heavy at times um uh pwi is predominantly white institutions and other language 
um, maybe some of that's in our resources, perhaps, if you look at that later, but there's language here, and these are real lived experiences, and um, ladies, thank you so much for, sh for sharing. Um, I'm going to move on to this question as it pertains to where we are and what we're doing here today, um, and I'm going to open it up, and I think we're already doing this, but the question is, what do you panelists think academic institutions can do moving forward to support the goals of their black and brown students? I'll start. Learn how to pronounce their names correctly. There, that's my piece. That's important. I would like to add, um, in addition to learning their names correctly, um, culturally responsive teaching practices. I think that's important. Uh, mentorship, um, more black instructors, not only in the classroom, but within throughout the um, educational institution, administrators, um, leaders, deans. Um, I would also um, include mentorship um, more programs of um, having individuals as mentors to help those students guide them through um, their educational journey. There's a lot of individuals who come through um, colleges and they don't have the guidance. They don't have the um, mentors maybe at home within their community, but they're trying to get through that educational process. So having um, networks or connections where it's giving those individuals opportunities to speak to others about um, concerns that they may have, struggles that they may have, even if it's that imposter syndrome of, I don't think I should be here, but allowing, um, having a space for those individuals to be able to sit down and speak to others regarding um, those issues that they may be facing. And then uh, financial resources, not only, um, filling out the financial aid form, but if there's opportunities for grants or scholarships, um, explaining those to students, because sometimes students don't know. All they know is to fill out this um, financial aid packet. So those other options that are out there for students. Absolutely. Um, and, and if I may just add another aspect to this, um, as much as we are all, you know, women of color, whether it's black or brown, I think also institutions should recognize the diversity within those titles. Because when we're talking about the distribution of resources or the recognition of that diversity, um, as an immigrant, for example, I may not have um, financial aid resources that are available to me. Um, or as an immigrant woman, um, how you, how imposter syndrome plays out in my life or in the context of my culture is completely different than it does for another. Because when you think about it for a lot of um, women of color who are outside of, who come from other, um, other countries, you don't become black until you hit, you know, um, JFK airport. You were never a black woman. You were never a brown woman. Those are titles that are very specific to this country. And so for a lot of, um, I know for myself and for a lot of um, um, peers and even people who I know who've advanced ahead of me, um, negotiating what it means to be a black woman in academia is being done in parallel with taking courses and trying to figure out, you know, how, my, how I'm paying my bills. And um, so I think recognizing the diversity and the diversity of needs within those um, terms of black or brown or, you know, insert whatever color America designates you. I think that's also um, important for institutions to recognize. I'll just add one thing as well to the conversation. I remember graduating trade school back in 2000 and we couldn't leave without a job. We did not graduate and consider ourselves complete until there was a job placement opportunity, whether we took the job or not. We had to have that handshake of education, employment. And I think that's not a strong goal 
for a lot of our graduating students. It's, I got a degree, now I'm gonna go work at McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. And I feel like that gap of goal setting and opportunities should be level set. Why go this long and do this great thing to do nothing with it? And we have to encourage our young black students that it's okay to walk away with a good paying job because you worked hard and you deserve it. And I just remember talking to my, my stepson just two years ago who went to a collegiate high school and now works at a grocery store because his desire of next step did not connect with the hard work that he put in. So in black, our black students, we have to reconnect success and what next steps should look like, ideally, because they may not have it in their brains to automatically connect with that thinking. And we have to prepare them that the world's not gonna throw you a red carpet either. So just that encouragement. Oh, sorry, Chair, thank you. And I, I just wanna add, yes, I agree with everything. And just, I think something that goes across what everyone has said is, um, getting to know students where they're coming from, know more about their stories can, that can help us to understand more about their needs, the diversity in their identities and their experiences can help. And um, what they might possibly want to do, because sometimes I remember I didn't always know what it meant to get a, a PhD, for example. Um, and there were some programs like UNCF Mellon, which I did. Uh, the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program that helps with that, but a lot of um, some opportunities that some students that are not traditionally marginalized, there are things that they understand, such as accessing extracurricular opportunities and how to navigate institutions. That's not intuitive knowledge; it's actually cultural. So, if a student comes from a historically marginalized culture that is from outside of the institution, they might not know. So taking steps to get to know them and assess their needs and then how we can um, help to teach them what it is to navigate institutions um, and work with them to determine what they could do after they graduate is, I think, very helpful. Spaces like this are really important and this really inspires me too. Um, and I think having other types of spaces, um, someone's mentioning spaces that um, help to bridge, kind of break down the walls of academia and bridge academia with students, communities, and families, I think be helpful. Can I add also, you know, I, I really would like institutions to stop expecting the idea of belonging to fit differences forcefully. Instead, I wish that institutions would push the concept of institutional change forcefully. I wish that institutions can stop relying on best practices because those practices are only best for those who have traditionally succeeded in higher education. I wish that institutions would use new, different, sometimes uncomfortable and unique practices to match the unique students who are currently struggling to succeed with current practices. And institutions should stop hiring and promoting using traditional practices so that actual change can be created. Institutions should listen to how black students want to be supported and institutions should track to see what is working for black students and invest in and expand on that even if it doesn't fit. Thank you. All of that, right? Like that's, I don't, all of this. Ladies, thank you so much for taking time to share just a snippet. I know this conversation could and should continue. Um, and I, there are so many places that I wanted to chime in, but this isn't about me particularly. So I want to make time for um, a bit of Q and A, um, and also respecting your time. So Raina is going to help us with that. Um, do you want to ex explain? Yes, if there so on mute myself. And thank you all. That's really beautiful and, and words of wisdom for us to really take in, contemplate, and consider um, when it comes to our next steps here. Uh, do you want to? I know we're 
uh, our time is a little limited, but that's on my fault uh, because Latricia was messaging me like the time, like, no, let the conversation flow. You all have so much knowledge that are sharing out. Let it be. Uh, but with that being said, if anyone has some Q and A's here that are pressing, please um, go ahead and feel free to raise your hand. There's a little feature down at the bottom that you're able to raise your hand. Uh, so I could go ahead and unmute you or put you here. You could even turn your camera on or you could drop it in the chat, whatever you feel comfortable. But let's give some space for at least a, a few questions here, maybe three or so. And let's see. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I see one hand raised here. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, and put you as a panelist if you like to turn your camera on. If not, it's totally okay as well, whatever you feel comfortable. And Kim? Thank you. Correct. I'm Toby, I'm yes. director for, <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah, director for teacher certification programs at Rio Salado College. Um, so we've had a post back model for certification for almost 24 years. Uh, that uh, we believe uh, reduces barriers in terms of cost uh, to become certified in, in a K through 12 classroom. And now we've recently been approved for a bachelor's degree in education, elementary and special education, still at the community college cost $14,000. And I feel like uh, for four years, like total a degree for $14,000. And I still, we, we're, what are we missing when we talk about finding and being able to provide students with individuals that look like they do in their classrooms and yet I don't feel like families are supporting the idea of going into education because we we're, we're not we're we're we don't seem to be moving the mark I mean we've reduced the cost to become certified We've done our best to reduce the barriers. I'm just truly looking for insight. I've listened to the conversation, but what do we have to what do we have to do differently? And I know cost is not the only barrier. How do I get families to believe that education is so worthwhile? It's not. I mean, we need to pay teachers more. Is that why families aren't encouraging their, I've heard all of you wanting to go into trades and um, into your, uh, to the university systems, um, into STEM. How do I convince them to be teachers? Connect. We don't connect with the teachers. It's back to what Dr. McWilliams said, identifying ourselves within that arena will allow that arena to make sense to us. Why we're athletes, why we're, we're singers and rappers, because we can see ourselves in those scopes. Our classrooms, my daughter probably at seventh grade has had two black teachers. My older daughter has had none. We don't see ourselves in the classroom in a very positive, opportunity a lot of times until higher education or the church moms in the backgrounds we're not present and you can't you have to know the brain and the thinking i can't relate so that's out of my scope so it's it's to me education was never we have no teachers in our family that was never the connection you model what you see and you model what you engage with and no disrespect to the process, but that's sometimes the mindset of our kids. They do what they see. Um, I, I to to piggyback and offer a different perspective on this. I am the I am the as I've said. My father is a professor. My mother is a teacher by degree and a librarian by, you know, career choice path. I grew up on I grew up all over the United States at colleges, you know, like institutions like Yale University, Union Theological, ASU, all these places. And in all of these spaces, I saw black and brown faces. So I had a different experience growing up. I grew up in academia and I saw teachers who looked like me and at every place that I went, except for in the school systems. 
So that wasn't, it wasn't that education wasn't being promoted in my community. It wasn't that my parents and the, their friends and their peers and the people that I grew up with, we all knew the value of education. At 18, when I went away to a predominantly black uh, PWI, predominantly white institution, coming from this where, where I was raised, the way that I was raised, I knew about black authors, et cetera. My mentor, my freshman year at my at Eckerd College, here I am, an 18-year-old student, excited to be away at college. When I got my first grade back on a paper that I wrote about the great Gatsby, I was excited about it. I got a C on that paper never gotten a C before in academia, I went to my mentor, a professor, a white woman, to sit down to kind of get feedback. And she looked across from me and said, you should be excited about that C because your people aren't known for their writing skills. I, I knew even at 18, based upon my background, I grew up with writers, I grew up with teachers, I grew up with professors. I knew she was wrong. And it destroyed something in me for many years as a student. She took something. So I think that not only do is it about getting the families to understand the importance of education, we have to, as institutions, really reset and calibrate and challenge our instructors. We need to, like someone here on this panel said, Listen to our students when they're reporting in things that are unjust. That trauma affected me until I got in grad school. And I told my grad professor when he complimented me on my writing. And he said, I wish all my students wrote like you. And I shared that story with him. This was 15 years later. And he said to me, you realize that lady was an idiot. But I, I, I knew it, but it, I, it was here. So we really have to look at institutions as well, Kim, as because um, I mean, in the black community, education is we understand that is an out that is a means out in many places. So we have to look at what are we as institutions not doing to attract these students. So that's yeah, all thank I wanted you. to share. Thank that. you. Have, yeah, trying to, to get more people to believe that we need just teachers in general, just yeah. good quality. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I, I see two hands. Uh, Dr. McWilliams, I saw your first, and, and then Dr. Latrice, please. And thank you for that question. Yeah, I think it's really important to create when we're creating narrative about why there's something happening in the community to make sure that it's backed by data and to track the reasons why things exist. Because, you know, I'm going to use annotate, annotated uh, uh, anecdotal information because this stuff is not tracked. But I know as an instructor that there are tons of educators who look like me who are not given the positions and who are fighting out here while we're also listening to the fact that people are saying, we want to hire you. We're like, well, why isn't it happening? You know? And so what I do know in my research and seeing that when you find black women, particularly in leadership positions in higher education, the qualification for them has always been masters or doctorate. But then you see people of other nationalities or races, and you see that there's people who have bachelor's degrees, and there's one here at CSUN who has an AA. And so it's not about always, let's encourage them to become educated or want to be in these positions. Oftentimes it's, let's restructure how we hire and how we promote uh, because we're missing uh, opportunities to bring in the people who want to be here. I agree with what everyone um, on the panel discuss. I think um, for me, I've been in education for almost 30 years now. I taught in um, Chicago, Illinois. I taught in Stockton, California, and here in Arizona. Um, there has been a shift in the uh, teaching field, um, and I think it's discouraging for some individuals wanting to go into the field of teaching because of all of the politics that's involved. Also, with um, Tara was saying, um, I know specifically um, here in Arizona, um, there's a lack of 
um, black instructors in the classrooms where my daughter is a senior in high school and I think she only had two black instructors since being in school here in Arizona. My son is in seventh grade and this is his first year having a, a black instructor, um, a teacher. So those students not seeing themselves um, in leadership and that could be one um, issue of preventing those from going into the field of education. Um, also, like Kim said, the lack of pay. A lot of times um, people consider that when they're going into the field of education that I'm paying all of this tuition and then I become a teacher, but how am I going to be able to live and pay back my student loan? It's not worth it being a teacher. Also, um, what Dr. McWilliams uh, was saying and as far as the hiring practices, um, those individuals um, getting teaching positions, um, but sometimes as being a black person, you can maybe get hired to work over in one area, um, but not over in a different area. And I know that from personal experience here in Arizona. And then being in different school districts and not being able to um, move up the ladder to um, more leadership positions, depending on the district that you actually work in. Um, so what Dr. McWilliams was saying, having different degrees, me, by the time I got here to Arizona, I already had a bachelor's and um, two, uh, well, one master's. I was just completing my second master's, maybe three years after moving here and not being able to um, get a leadership position, but seeing other people get leadership positions that can be discouraging for some people. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a, a couple of things. I know we're on over on time, but I also everything everyone said has really resonated with me and then just made me think about different things. Um, I really appreciate the um, question and I put in the chat um, the culture trap and it, um, it's a book by an educational researcher um, an educator named Darren Wallace. It's a recent book that just came out in 2023, but that video I gave is of him talking about it. And then he has a short cartoon where he shows the kind of as an intro to the book in that talk. But um, we are talking about sometimes, so the, the reason for um, either educational realities that black students experience or ideas about their educational realities. And I think those are two things that are different the ideas and narratives around it and then the reality but a lot of times they can be related to and um i think that sometimes if if we're engaging let's say in a class or more in a school um and we see what seems to be like a a, a, a cultural practice of like not caring about education enough sometimes what happens is is we might not be um aware of the systemic and historical factors that play into what we're seeing as one thing. So the structural factors um, that are national and historical. Um, and so like Darren Wallace, for example, he did a comparative study where he researched a school in New York City and then in London and um, saw that um, in New York City, there's kind of an idea of, you probably heard of a model minority where sometimes Asian people are considered a model minority. Um, still marginalized, but considered sort of a model for other minorities. Well, in, Lund in New York, he found that Caribbean students were considered that and they were expected to do better um, than African-American students, for example. And part of that does have to do with the sort of like culture um, historically in some Caribbean communities to really um, value education. But Darren Wallace also attributes that or um, relates that to historical institutional privileges that Caribbean communities have gotten to immigrate to the United States, not necessarily the same to the um, for every family, but he's saying that culture comes up inside of structure. And so when you look at um, a community that hasn't had those same um, institutional privileges, but instead has actually been kept away from them, um, 
then you're going to have different cultural manifestations um, compared to in London, where we found that Caribbean students, that same sort of model minority um, myth or expectation doesn't exist for them, that narrative. And so he remembers a student who was of Caribbean descent asking a teacher why she didn't get as good of a grade as she normally gets, as someone shared a story here. Um, and the teacher said, well, you're already exceeding expectations for who she was as a Caribbean student. But in New York City, a Caribbean student was not doing as well. And the teacher who was a white teacher, there's both white teachers in London and New York. He said, well, you're Caribbean, you're supposed to do well, right, compared to the other students. So sometimes we have ideas that we don't realize how they're kind of tied to structure these realities. But then also there are realities and there are narratives how we come to think about um, students, um, so how we kind of like internalize those narratives and then how students internalize them about themselves. So I, I call us to think about culture as situated inside of structure. Um, and then maybe we could sort of help to from there start to explore how cultural measures can be taken to help um, repay debts owed to students. And um, thinking about this specific context, uh, I'm like there's a, this piece by Sonia Douglas um, and for Letta Sampson, school segregation in the Mississippi of the West, some people call, you know, Southern Nevada or Las Vegas, Mississippi of the West, just to start getting an uh, idea about historical segregation and then thinking about how that can um, in schools and thinking about how that can inform students' experiences too. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your responses and providing us resources as well. I'll make sure to add them to the little the, the list created. And um, Dr. McWilliams, there's a question here in the chat. Uh, can you elaborate on why you described your appearance and what you were wearing in your introduction for folks in the audience who may not know? And how has your faith conceived impacted your journey? Sure. Um, I, we discussed as a, a group that we would um, use descriptive language in our introduction for those who may be visually impaired. Uh, so they get an idea of who would be speaking to them today. With regards to spirituality, um, I'm not sure if that was for the entire panel or just for me, but um, uh, spirituality guides me through everything I do. Uh, I don't know if I would be as resilient as I am without the faith that I have and the, the, the pieces of my belief system that guide me even through when hope, my hope is tested. And so I, I'm very grateful to that and it's a staple in my life. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McWilliams. And I believe it was to you. Yes. And um, let me see. We have two uh, <laughs> hands raised here. So we have Ali, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Ali, and as well put you, uh, make you a panelist if you'd like to turn on your camera. One more. And again, I'm sorry we're, we're pressing the time, but hopefully just stay if you can. If not, please, we'll, we'll, this is recorded and we'll be sending bursts of resources. All right, hello, thank you so much. Okay, I don't wanna mess it up. So do I pronounce your name on the panel, ma'am, Dortricia? Oh, yeah, it, can I hear, I don't know if I can hear you correctly. Well, I'd have to, I, I, did, I was unmuted. I was muted, I apologize. Uh, thank you, it's Dortricia. Dortricia, okay. yes? Dortricia, Dortricia. Dortricia, gotcha. There thank you so, <laughs> so much. I really didn't wanna mess that up. I appreciate your patience. Thank you. I have a question. I would like to know, um, you know, you had that really aggressive comment that was, you know, very deeply uh, painful and inappropriate and downright cruel from that professor. And I would like to know how that affected like your uh, personal and professional career. And then also like, what did you do to get through that experience? I would like to know so I could be a greater support. And I would also like to know um, because I know um, many, many people have that same experience still in 2024, and I would like to know how to hold better space for them and what I can do to be truly more supportive of people with those types of experiences and what would have helped you back then. Um, does, does that make sense? Uh, absolutely, and Ali, thank, thank you for- Thank you so uh, much. 
asking the question. It's a hard one. I've, it's one that I've reflected on um, time and time again over my life's journey. And what's interesting is I've replayed it different times um, because there was a time at which I was, it, it really literally initially, it, it shut me down. Yes. And I've asked myself, like I struggled after that for a while in school at, at my college. I was away from my family. And I asked myself the question as an adult, like, why didn't you tell your parents? Now, my parents were in professors, right? Like, so it wasn't that I came from a space where they would not have addressed this. But there is something also, I still haven't answered that for myself. But it was something that I, I was like, I think that I disassociated on some level, like yeah. the shock mm -hmm. of someone like saying this to me, who's supposed to be my mentor for four more years, for three years, like through, I'm a freshman at the time, um, for, at least, and there was shame associated with this. Right. I think as I reflect on it, you know, as a student, that was my first C. You know, and also coming from the family that I came from, knowing what what I did about my culture, my parents may have said, "Why didn't you address it differently?" You know, like I don't, I know they would have supported me, and my father probably would have made phone calls as a professor. I'm sure of it, but I think there was amount of shame and 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 pain that was so deeply rooted. You have to understand, I had planned to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write, mm -hmm. and that lady, in her name is Julie Imprick, and uh, I followed her career because there. I, at one point, I was like, I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to dedicate it to her. Like that was going to be, you know, for in my, for a period of time, that's what, what I thought I would do. As a, I'll show you. Absolutely. Um, but then honestly, uh, and and I think it it made me distrustful of spaces that were supposed to be for me, but overtly hostile. Right. There was a part of me that shut down and even into my career. Um, I think it's affected me. There's a level of distrust because people say that they're like we've talked about in this panel institutions and places where if you do these things, if you get the degrees, if you jump through the hoops, if you excel. In your in your in, you know, in your academic pursuits and your professional pursuits that there will be space made for you. And that's not what I've experienced. No, that's not this, what you've experienced. Even, even yeah. to this day. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's, an, but where, but what comes into place is what Dr. McWilliams talks about, where our spirituality and our faith, and our inherent belief in ourselves. See, I'm, 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 I stand on the backs of great people, in my family, as well as in my community. And that anchors me and has helped to heal me. And so when I choose, what I choose for myself, what I've learned at this point is that no one dictates what my future is for me, except for me, unapologetically. And as um, we talked about here, understanding that I don't, what you see in this panel is the composite of what, black is not a monolith. I hope that's one of the takeaways from all of this, that we as black women come from different walks of life, life lived experiences, cultural norms, et cetera. And there's so much more to us than just what you see. And if people would stop making assumptions and ask the questions, had a professor said to me, followed up and said, how can I help you? If I'd had resources on that predominantly, um, my PWI on my college campus, where I was only the one of a handful of people who looked like me, if the institution had created spaces and resources for me, if I'd had mentors who checked in, hey, because we understand that you come from a different lived experience, not socioeconomically, but just because of my lived experience as a person of color, a black woman, we just wanna make sure you're okay. That would have made the difference maybe. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Sorry, not trying to cut you off. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I really appreciate it so much. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellie. And thank you, 
for sharing with us. And we have one last question here. We could have one or two of the panelists answer. Uh, and it's Katrina, I believe. Yes. Katrina, I believe you could, yeah, uh, a little bit. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, first off, no, that's perfect. Say this was one of the best conferences that I've ever been on in a very, very long time. So I appreciate seeing my Black women on conference because I go to many conferences and I see the same type of people on there. So. Oh my God, I'm so ecstatic and, and so grateful to see you guys on here. My question um, for you guys is, of all the trials and tribulations that you've been through, what would you say was your greatest Tada moment? I can go first because mine is about to happen. I, like, you know, I just finished my dissertation in uh, in 2023, and I I I was conferred in August, and so I will be walking the stage in May, and I will say tada at the end, just because you said that. Now I'm I'm gonna say tada because I'm like she did that, and and I'm so excited. I'm bringing my little sister and her two daughters and to think that I was thinking about them before they were, were born. And the idea of walking across the stage of an Ivy League university, because I graduate from University of Pennsylvania, from that kid in foster care fighting for her sister in court, like I just mentioned earlier, and being able to bring them to an Ivy and creating a legacy of that for them. You know, it will be my ta-da, that will be my ta-da. Thank you. I would say um, accomplishing my doctorate degree, that was my tada moment. Um, the moment that I felt like for me that I've made it. Um, again, my story growing up on the south side of Chicago, being raised by my grandparents, um, helping my grandmother take care of my younger siblings, also helping my father take care of my younger siblings, um, having a lot of challenges, a lot of struggles along the way, being a single mom, um, going through the doctoral program with um, my two kids, having to juggle their sports schedule with my son in baseball, my daughter was playing softball and dance school at the same time. So trying to um, just manage and maintain all of these different struggles along with still going through all of the courses for the doctoral program and finishing my dissertation. I received my doctorate in, I think it was 21 now. So I received it in 21. Um, and that was the moment that I felt like I um, um, reached success according to my terms, that I made it according to my terms. And like um, what Dotricia was saying, um, those people who may have doubted me or said that you weren't good enough when I, or you weren't smart enough when I was in elementary or middle school or high school, even when I started the doctoral program, I had those individuals, whether it was family members or friends, why are you taking this? And you're not going to be able to succeed. So having all of that um, put forth and then being able to accomplish and reach my goal, because that was my goal that I wanted to achieve my doctorate. So coming to the point where I felt like I'm not doing this for someone else, I'm doing it for myself. That was my Tada moment. Um. If I can just add, I think for me, obviously, I'm not yet there. I'm just now finishing my associates. But um, back to an earlier question that was asked um, for Dotricio, you got the C. For me, it was a D that I got um, in junior high when I had first got here. And it was an English class, which was very strange to me. Um, and when I approached the instructor, it was 
very minor or nonsensical points that I got off because I don't say garbage can. I, you know, I don't say trash can. I say garbage can, or um, I use the word trousers instead of pants. And so I remember how confident um, of a student I was before um, I came to this country. And when you say, when we speak of a tada moment, for me actually happened quite recently. Um, and in the process of this conversation, I think that has um, become augmented and magnified um, in the sense that I realized who I was before I became black, because black is a flat term that takes away um, the legacy of who you were before that. And Dr. Uh, McWilliams, you talked about beginning a legacy. I think you are continuing a legacy because for me, when I think of from a cultural standpoint, my father's tribe had many clans inside of which um, specific clans were heralded as the orators, the poets, other clans that were the teachers of the community, other clans that were the blacksmiths and the goldsmiths. So there was this huge legacy that came before I became black. But in the process between that day in junior high to the day I decided to return back to school as an adult learner, I realized that so much of me had been chipped away that took away the confidence that I had as a child to be a good student and to live up to who I naturally or, um, you know, the, the abilities that I have internally, because so much of what this country does to us as black people, as women, is to chip away at every other aspect of us and say that you are just purely black and that is it. And so when we think of legacy, when we think of um, what that tada moment for me personally was when I remembered who I was before I became black. And I think it's the onus is for all of us to like kind of explore what that means and not just begin with a, a point in history that really is an artificial point. That was beautiful, Becca. And like I said, you are already there. I mean, I see you. I just started, but I've seen you in these meetings. I see how you speak, how you care, how you lead your passion. And I, I mean, I'm just excited to have met you and see the journey ahead of you. So um, thank you for everything you do. And thank you for sharing your experience. And um, I want to be mindful uh, of time. And I think that might conclude our Q&A session and our event today. I know it took a little bit longer, but you know, this is what's needed. We need to hear the voices from our amazing panelists. You're all so, so incredible. Thank you for everything you do, your commitment, the dedication you show day to day. I've been lucky to have seen it in one of each of you in one way or another and to be in this space. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll be sharing some resources after I have the emails of many of the people that participated as well as a QR, QR code to tell us what your thoughts were of this event. And also want to challenge and post to you all, what could we do in our institutions and in our programs and our day to day to help bridge equity gaps to help support our black communities and to make a positive impact like we all did today. So thank you all so much and have a beautiful rest of Monday and rest of your week. Thank you for this reviving conversation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Take care. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience, for being here. Have a great one. Take care, everybody. Yes, yes, sorry. I'm just here trying to see if there's anyone else that has any last minute questions into college. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like, Ooh. okay, oh, let me um, record meeting. Let me one second. I'm going to stop recording. Yes.